So we're going to talk tonight about uh, finish strong. And um, this word has come to me, um, or, or actually was nurtured in me for quite some time. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was um, listening to an interview that somebody had with Dr. James Dobson. And for those of you who don't know, he is a well-known Christian psychologist, made a huge impact in the world. Uh, his father was, was full-time in the ministry, and um, at the end of his father's life, um, he prayed. Actually, his father and his uncle, and his uncle was busy dying, and his father was praying and seeking God's face and, and asking God, Lord, just, just give us a, a couple of more years to win more souls for you. And God told his father um, that I will grant your request, but it will not be through you. It will be through your son. And then, uh, of course, James Dobson became this well-known uh, Christian psychologist and had a major impact. He was, uh, he's reckoned as one of the most influential evangelical leaders in the United States. And he's now in his 80s and still going strong. So at the end of this interview, um, the guy that did the interview looked at him. And he said, what is that one piece of advice that you would like to leave with people, that you would like to leave with the audience? And he looked very intently at the guy and he said, finish strong. Finish strong. And then he started to explain. He said, although I am in my 80s, I can still fall. I need to watch myself. And then he said that there are so many people that started strong in the Lord. They started the race and they ran with everything inside of the, them. And yet they fell along the way. They got distracted. And uh, Siobhan is uh, watching this series with, uh, with our children called God's Generals. And it's astounding how, how, how many of these giants in the faith started really strong. But they ended somewhat meek and uh, and sort of distracted. And it's such a pity. Because I believe God's heart, Nico, for you and for me, is that we will stay focused, that we will stay on course, and that each one of us will finish strong, that one day when we stand in front of him, that he will look at you with a smile on his face, and that he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Over little you were faithful, over much I will give you authority. Amen. And that's my prayer for each one of you. So what we're going to share tonight, I believe Daniel has got the ability to help you and me to stay on course and to remain focused even in this time where everything is a bit topsy-turvy and the temptation is there to stumble a bit and to get off track, but that we will remain focused and that each one of us will, uh, will finish strong. Amen? There's a scripture in, in, um, in Galatians chapter 5, uh, verse 7, that um, where Paul is writing, and he's writing to the church in, in Galatia, and he said, you were running a great race. I mean, you guys were, were doing great. You were, you were running a great race, but somebody cut in in front of you. And, uh, and, and how, how could you allow that? Because that is now preventing you from obeying the truth. And that picture is so vivid for me, because I remember I did some middle distance when I was in school, and uh, I remember that one race... Um, I can't remember if it was in the beginning or the second lap, but somebody cut in in front of me and sort of tripped me, and I fell. And um, I had to you know, jump up quickly and start to run again. And um, I missed the qualifying times with, with a fraction of a second, the qualifying time, and I couldn't go on for the season just because of that. And I believe God's heart is tonight that, that you and I will not stumble and fall, but if we had in the past that, he will give us the grace through His Spirit and by the blood of Christ that we will stand up again and that we will run. Uh, um, David is writing at a certain place in the Psalms, can't recall now where. He says, even though the righteous may fall seven times, every time he will stand up. And that's the beauty of the gospel of Christ. Amen. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to base our, our conversation this evening on... Um, on, somebody, on a documentary I watched, and um, in this documentary, the documentary was all about how the brain works, and in this portion, ex um, especially how the brain works under extremely stressful situations, and what we can do to remain focused. And when I pondered on that, 
afterwards, I just discovered there are so many biblical truths in what was shared there. You know, so oftentimes in the world, people took biblic, take takes biblical truths and things out of the world and they word and they apply it and it's successful because it's truth. And wherever you apply truth, you know, it will have an effect. If you apply forgiveness, you know, you will reap the benefits of forgiveness. And so, uh, so in this documentary, they shared four techniques. And what they did, how they came about it is that um, in that section of the documentary, they looked at the, the, the training that they give for the special forces of the um, American Army, the Navy SEALs. And um, for those of you who know a little bit about the space training, the special force training, it's quite intense physically but also mentally. But at a certain stage in their, in their training, they go through this exercise where they put on scuba gear and they dump the guys in a deep swimming pool and they have to remain there for an extended period of time. And then the instructors will go and they will come and harass them continuously. So what they'll do, they'll rip off their oxygen mask or they'll twist the, the oxygen tube or they'll close the, the oxygen, oxygen bottles and... Um, the brain is structured in such a way that one of our biggest fears is the, that, that you will not have air to breathe. And to remain calm under the, that pressure and that anxiety takes immense focus. And, uh, and oftentimes what happens is that they start to panic, they lose focus, and then they go up for air. And when they do that, they're thrown off course. You know, they, they, they drop from the course. So they thought really hard, what can they do to help these guys? And they developed these four techniques. And they taught these four techniques to these trainees uh, to become Navy SEALs. And when they started to apply that, suddenly, you know, many, many, many more trainees became successful, you know, in completing the course to become Navy SEALs, especially under those immense stressful uh, and pressured situations. And that's what I want to base our talk on tonight. Uh, because I believe that uh, many of that is also um, based on, on truth that we see in the Bible. All right, so are you ready? Are you ready for some space training? And uh, I believe God's just going to give you some tools this evening, some keys in your midst. So as you apply that in your life, that, um, that you will, it will give you the ability to remain focused and to finish strong. Amen? That's ultimately what we want to do, and I believe that's what God wants in your and my life as well. Right, so I'm quickly going to mention those four techniques, and then we're going to look at each one of them individually. Right, so the first one, for those of you who take notes, the first one is focus on the end. Right, focus on the end. The second technique is speak Truth to self. Speak truth to self. The third technique is routines. Routines. And the fourth one is breathe or breathing. Right, so they might sound very basic and simple to you, but let's unpack them one by one. So you can turn in your Bible with me to Hebrews chapter 11. And of course, the first technique that we're talking about is focus on the end. And, um, and what they shared in this discovery, or in this documentary rather, is that when they taught the trainees or the soldiers to focus on the end, on a successful end, it really helped them to stay course and to stay focused when they were in that swimming pool, even with a constant harassment from the instructors. They needed to envision a positive outcome. That, In other words, they need to see themselves after an hour or extended period of time climbing out of the swimming pool, and they made it. And just the fact that they focused on a positive end helped them to stay focused and to stay on course. It sounds very simple, but it's powerful when you start to apply it. Now, in Hebrews chapter 11, 
It says, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and, and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. And of course, the whole of chapter 11, it talks about these faith heroes. And um, in verse 13, it says, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them. And I say saw them louder so that you can see that's important. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. In verse 14, they were looking for a country of their own. And what I want you to see is that there's a direct correlation be between what you see in the spirit and the level of faith that you possess. I'm going to say it again because I want you to hear it. There's a direct correlation between what you see in the spirit and the level of faith that you possess. Now it goes on and it says um, towards the end of chapter 11, verse 32, um, and what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword. Listen carefully. Whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle, and route, rooted foreign armies. So what we see is that people that had a clear vision of what God showed them, what's going to happen in the future, that raised a certain level of faith, and that steered and navigated their actions up to the point where they found strength in weakness, and they persevered with courage. In a certain sense, the future the prophetic future infiltrated their lives in the here and the now. This is so important. I mean, we can, we can, there are so many examples in the Bible. Habakkuk, the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk in chapter 1, he says, I'm screaming out to God. I'm so frustrated with the situation that I see around me. Everything in, around me just makes me negative. I'm so frustrated. And in chapter 2, he says, but I will go and stand on my watchtower and look to see what God shows me. That's the whole point of the book of Revelations. It says the crown and the, and the, um, the, the, crown and the benefits and the, um, I struggle with the, for the right English word, the um, the price will come to those, chapter 2 and chapter 3, for those who persevere. And then the whole book of Revelation is a future vision of what God will do with the enemy. It's a book of hope. You know, I was always scared spitless when I read Revelation as a little boy. You know, at a certain stage, I stayed in a, in a caravan outside of our home. You know, I was, I was, I was a great, I think, grade 6, grade 7, round about there. And I read Revelation. I was so scared, you know, because of all these images. But no, it's a book of hope because it tells us that one day, the child of God will come and he will, he will deal with the enemy. And all that we need to do, we need to stay on course and we need to persevere. So I want to ask you in this time, there are so many, so many voices, so many future visions that are illustrated for you and for me by the media by casual discussions, by, by what we read on social media. But I want to ask you, what is God showing you at this moment about your future? Prophetically. Because what you believe you see for the future is going to infiltrate how you, how you, how you handle your life right now. What is God showing you about your family, about this country, about your finances, about your health? What is that prophetic word that God gave you about your future? And by the way, Jeremiah 29 verse 11 says, it's a hopeful future, right? So let me share with you out of my own life, at the, at the, right at the beginning of this lockdown period, 
I had two day words where I just really experienced God. God told me through His Spirit, this is what you should believe in. This is what you're going to hold on to. And the one day word were, um, was from, uh, from Numbers chapter 13. And you know the story how the spies went into the promised land and they came back. And only Joshua and Caleb believed the word of God. And uh, because the others did not believe, they, they influenced the whole of Israel and um, that whole generation actually lost um, the, the promise of going into the promised land. And um, it is as if the Spirit of God told me, that's what I experienced, he said, Vipi, what are you going to believe? You know, are you going to believe the negativity? Are you going to believe the giants, what they tell you? Or are you going to believe my word and the prophetic destiny that I have declared over your life and over this country? And the second day word came out of Second Kings, I think it's chapter 7, yeah, Second Kings chapter 7. So what happens there is that the whole Assyrian army were surrounding, surrounded uh, Jerusalem. And uh, up to the point where there was famine in, uh, in Jerusalem, in the city of Jerusalem. And um, I'm not going to go into detail, but they were looking for food. And then the story goes on that four lepers outside of the city said, well, I mean, we leopard, lepers, we anyway don't have something to hope for and look out for. Let's just go to the Assyrian army in the camp. And when they got there, they discovered that the whole Assyrian army fled and just left everything there, food and belongings and valuables and so on. And, of course, they went back to the city and they told the people, and what's so astounding in that story is that just the day before, um, uh, I think the king of Jer you know, sent for the prophet. And he asked the prophet, what will happen with the situation? And the prophet said, tomorrow, this time, uh, so much and so much will sell for a, for a much higher price. And it sounded impossible. And one of the servants of the king said, I don't believe it. You know, how would that be possible? And the prophet told him, because you did not believe it, you will not see it. And uh, when the people discovered this wonderful news, they ran out, and in the stampede, that person died. And uh, what, what I just experienced, God told me, is that I've got the ability to change the situation, even in this country, in one day. So I'm living with, with the hope and with faith that even irrespective of what we see around us, God is working in ways we cannot see. And he will turn it around in this country and for us, and especially for us as a, as a congregation, in one day. And that's the prophetic word that I'm holding. And I'm asking you, what word have you got over your situation, over your family, over your finances, over your future? What word are you holding on to? The power of the prophetic. Envision that end. All right. And not an end that the, that the enemy wants to tell you about what's going to happen with, with your family and with your descendants. And No. The future that God shows you. Amen. Focus on the end. Right. The second technique that we're talking about is uh, speak truth to self. Speak truth to self. And of course, um, the technique that they taught the soldiers, the, um, the Navy SEALs, is that talk positively to yourself. So, I mean, it just makes sense. How many times do you think, how many words, Nico, do you think you speak to yourself per minute in your head? Quite a lot, all right? So, on average, they say that we can speak verbally with our mouth about 140 to 160 words per minute. In your mind, you can think many, many more words per minute. I think 400 plus you can comprehend uh, per minute. And, uh, and imagine 80% of, of the words and the talk that you have with yourself is negative. Where will you end? No, I can't do this. It's too difficult. Oh, I messed up again. I'm a failure. I'm an idiot. And so on. I, I mean, I know you don't talk to yourself like that. It's other people in other, <laughs> other places. So, a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Cornelius gave a brilliant sermon. It really blessed me. And if you haven't listened to it, I really want to encourage you to go onto the website and, and find it. But the word was all about loving yourself, all right? And love yourself with the love of God. And, and I just want to read that scripture again. 
in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 onwards, it says, Jesus replied, um, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And of course, Pastor Cornelius shared in that sermon that um, he asked the question, how can you love other people if you don't love yourself? And I want to challenge you this evening. The words that you use towards yourself, the thoughts that you think about yourself, how accurate is it? Are those really thoughts and words coming from the heart of God? Or is it maybe a little bit tinted with the words of the enemy? You see, the devil has got no hold on you and me unless we believe his lies. The moment he can get it right for you to believe the lies about yourself, he sort of, he's got a hook, he's got a hold on you. And slowly but surely, he would like to reel you in, but it's going to stop in Jesus' name. Amen. So what I want to encourage you is, I just wrote down a couple of things that I, I felt, but maybe this, this means something to some of you. Instead of thinking or saying in this time that I'm afraid of not having enough, of having lack, what about saying that, Lord, I'm grateful for your provision and that your eyes is on the sparrow. And if you look after them, Lord, you're a loving father and you will look after me as well. Instead of pondering on thoughts of self-condemnation, oh, I again messed up, I again fell for that sin, I again uh, me, you know, made a mistake. Instead of pondering on those thoughts, why not thinking that, thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus that just washes me clean. And thank you through the blood of Jesus, today can be a new day. Instead of pondering and nurturing thoughts and words of fear, of abandonment, of feeling alone, why not quoting that scripture, it says that I am the apple of his eye. Psalm 139 says, he hems me in from behind and before, and he lays his hand upon me. Instead of pondering that I'm not able, looking at my failures, why not saying that, I'm more than able through Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit that gives me strength and that His strength will be made perfect in my weaknesses. Instead of pondering on thoughts that I'm unwanted, why not say that I'm treasured and that my name is engraved on the palms of His hands with the nails of Golgotha. Amen. So in uh, James chapter 1 verse 2, 21 to 22, you don't have to turn there, I'll quickly read it. Uh -huh. I did not put a bookmark there, or a little label, so let me just quickly turn there. James chapter 1, verse 21 to 22, it says, Therefore get rid of all moral filth, and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. In the Afrikaans it says, we can save your souls. That's where your emotions and, and your thinking patterns are. So the picture that I just see when I read this is this tree that takes root through your spirit, and the, the roots of the tree just starts to penetrate every place and every fiber and every part of your whole being. And you know the roots of a tree can really mess up certain things at a home. It can lift the foundation, it can do this and that and that. But in a good way, the, the, if the Word of God takes root inside of you, it can infiltrate every part of who you are. And I really want to challenge you in this time. I know all of us are experiencing pressure. I know the temptation is there to lose focus. And to get afraid. But I want to ask you, let the word of God about yourself and what God says, Ruth, about you, let it take root in you. And ponder on it. And say it. 
and write out three or five scriptures that God says about you and put it on the mirror and against, you know, next to at the fridge, put it with a magnet on the fridge and say those words over yourself and your family and your loved ones and those in your cell groups. Say it because the truth of God, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. I'm saying this prophetically, my brother, my sister, this is the time where God wants to set you free from self-condemnation. God wants to set you free from a poor self-image. God wants to set you free from those words that, that the that, that people in the past spoke about you, negative things, and that got stuck in your head, and you keep on believing those lies, it will stop in the name of Jesus. Step out in faith and say what the Word of God is saying about you. Amen? God believes in you. And the future that He's got for you is to give you a hope and a blessed future. Amen? Believe that. That's true. Right. Are you ready for the third technique? You still okay? Still here? Good. Right, so the third technique. Help me. That's right, routine. So close your eyes and see how you brush your teeth. I'm serious. Right, so it says in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. Is anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching of righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. So what they found when they started to teach these soldiers, when they down there, and the instructors come and they arrest them. They rip off their oxygen masks or they twist the oxygen tube. They close down the flow of the air. They discover that is not the time for those soldiers to try to figure out a solution to the problem. Because you're under pressure and you become anxious and then you try to... And then you start to make mistakes and make wrong decisions. No, 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 no. You have to learn before the time what to do. And you have to do it over and over and practice it and practice it and practice it. Step one to seven over and 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 again and again and again and again and again until it is second nature, until you don't have to think about it, until when you're under pressure and you want to become anxious, it is so second nature that you just do it. So, when you're not under pressure, it sounds like the ten virgins, virgins who are, have had wisdom, when you're not under pressure, you bring in certain habits in your life so that when you are under pressure, it becomes a no-brainer. So when you're down there in that swimming pool and somebody comes and it rips off your oxygen mask or closes the flow of the air, you know you have to take off your bottle, you have to check the opening of the, of the oxygen tank, you have to check where the pipe goes, is it, is it properly connected, you go through the pipe, untangle the twists, see if it's connected to the oxygen mask, put it on your face, breathe, then put it on your head, and you do it over, and you know exactly what the routine is. So sometimes in our life, the enemy gets it right when we're under pressure that we start to panic, and then we try to sort of figure out things and try to become clever and try to figure out certain formulas on what to do. And oftentimes, it's much simpler than what we think. So, let me tell you what I, what I mean by that. There are basic truths that I believe you and I need to do. Keep on doing, whether we feel like it or whether we don't feel like it. Whether we want to do it or whether we don't want to do it. Just like the Nike tick sign, just do it. Because it's good for you. It's like Pastor Cornelius said last week. Just read the word. 
if it does something, you know, inside of you or not, whether you, 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 you're excited, whether you feel like it or whether you don't, just read the word. Just do it every day. Don't overthink it. Just stick to the routine. And it will pull you through. If you pressure it with finances, whether you've got much or whether you've got little, whether you've got food to eat, whether you don't want food, just give your tithe. Just do it. Because it is like brushing your teeth. If you do it, your teeth will remain clean. And your breath won't smell. People will like you more. All right? It's a no-brainer. It's like the assembly of the saints. The word says, don't neglect the assembly of the saints. So why, when we in COVID-19, do we want to withdraw ourselves and start to neglect the assembly of the saints? Just pitch up for the sermons, whether it's online or whether it's here physically, and just attend your cell group. Don't disconnect yourself. Just stick to the routine. But you see what the devil, I believe, one of his strategies in this time is he wants to throw us off rhythm because the whole world is changing its ways. Um, now everything is virtual, and now suddenly we start to question these basic routines. Just stick to the basics. I read the other, other day an article of how they want to solve blindness in the world. And so they've got all these technologies, in, you know, stuff that they want to inject in the eye, high-tech stuff, amazing things that they want to do. And then at the end of the article, they say, well, I mean, there's just there's one simple operation that costs, I think, $50. And if they can roll that out and give people access to that, it will solve 50% of blindness in the world. 50%. Just stick to the basics. The power is in the basics. And so there are some things, I mentioned some of them, but other things, other routines that that we should stay on course with and um, is, um, is covenant relationships. The principle of honor, honor one another. The principle of guarding and protecting the unity amongst ourselves. If you get an issue in your heart, just forgive and go and sort it out with that guy. Don't make rocket science out of it. Just stick to the routine. And uh, I mean, I, th I think those, that's pretty much the list that I wrote down. But I just ended off in my notes here. It has got nothing to do with your emotions or whether you want to do it or not. No, no, no. You, I want to <laughs> say it again. It has got nothing to do with your emotions or whether you want to do it or not. Because so oftentimes we say, I don't feel like it. I'm not ready for it. I'm not excited about it. I will wait until I get ready. I want to sleep a little bit late. I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to do that. No, stop. It has got nothing to do with what you want to do or not to do, whether you, you feel like it or don't feel like it. Just do it. Some mornings I don't want to brush my teeth, but I just do it because it's a routine. Amen? You get the point. Healthy routines. It's going to pull us through. Amen? And then the last one is breathing. Take a deep breath. Out again, slowly. Take a deep breath. And out again. So what they discovered, believe it or not, is that when those soldiers are under pressure and the temptation is there to panic, they have to breathe. Deep inhale, slow out. Deep inhale, slow out. And what it does, it just brings oxygen to the brain and you can think clearer what to do in that situation. And when I heard that, I just thought, first of all, of that scripture in uh, John chapter 20. Let me read it to you. John chapter 20. When Jesus uh, you know, died, he, he rose from the dead and now he's appearing to his disciples. And um, 20 verse 22, it says, again, Jesus said, peace be with you. And then he says, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. Listen carefully. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. 
It reminds me on Genesis 2, verse 7, where God formed the man out of the dust of the earth, and he breathed inside of him, and he became a living being. We, we sang the song this evening, right? It's your breath in our lungs. Do you know that one of the, the, the most amazing tools that you and I have in this time where the temptation is there to fall to anxiety and that the enemy can use pressure and anxiety and fear, one of the best tools that God gave us is His Holy Spirit. Amen? Did you know that the word for breathe and for blow and for wind and the word for spirit is exactly the same? Pneuma. Right? It's exactly the same word. No difference. The exact same word for spirit and for breathe. And what I just want you to see is in this time when you go into your prayer closet, when you take time alone with God, when we gather here as a congregation, just experience how the Spirit of God will blow over you. Amen? God wants to come and His anointing, the anointing of the Holy Spirit, will break the yokes that the situation and that the world and that the news and that you experience and certain things that you're going through, the anointing will break the yoke. Amen? God wants to come this evening, as, even as you sit here. I don't know you. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know the pressures that you're experiencing. I don't know your anxieties. But in this moment, just close your eyes where you sit there. Just close your eyes. Father, I pray right now in this moment that you'll just come and that you will blow over each one of us through your spirit. Thank you, Jesus, that you granted access for us, that your spirit is here. Just come and pour out the anointing of your Holy Spirit over each person as they sit here. Father, I pray every yoke that the enemy has placed on every person that it will be broken right now through your spirit. We take it by faith and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. So what you just experienced now, if you take it by faith and you start to walk with it, not only here, but tomorrow and on Tuesday and on Wednesday and on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, next week when we come together and the weeks after that, Flow with the Holy Spirit. I just wrote here when I wrote the notes, God wants to make life light. That's something that God is busy talking to me at this moment. It's just to bring back the joy in life. And I believe as we do that, this, as we start to flow with the Holy Spirit, as we start to move with the anointing, and we experience the lightness of walking with God, people will start to look at your life and start to ask questions. How on earth do you get it right? Why are you not concerned? Why don't you walk around with a frown on your face? Why are you not stressed? And that will become an opportunity for you, me and for you to, to, to testify about the amazing God that we serve. Amen? Number one, focus on the end. Get that prophetic word of God about your life and your situations and especially the situations that you stressed about. Secondly, speak truth about yourself. Get rid of those lies that the enemy wants to place in your head. Take in the word of God. Write out those scriptures, three or five. Put it everywhere in the home. Say it over yourself. Continuously in your head and out loud. Number three, routines. Healthy routines. Stick to the basics. It's not rocket science. It's like brushing your teeth. Just do it, all right? Just do it. Routines. And number four is breathe. Remember the Holy Spirit. God did not leave us alone when Jesus went to heaven. He gave us the Holy Spirit. He's here. He's with us right now. Yeah. Amen. And let's move with the Holy Spirit. The beauty, of course, of the gospel is that none of us are disqualified from the race. As I said in the beginning, even if the righteous fall seven times, every time he stands up. And through the blood of Christ, tonight can be a new beginning for you. Amen. 
stand up in faith, and through His Spirit, God's going to give you the strength to remain focused, to stay on course, and I trust God that each one of you, each one of you will stand one day before God, and that you finish strong. None of us know how long our race is, our personal race, but that each one of us will run the race up to the end and finish strong, and that one day God will look at you, each one of you, and say, well done good and faithful servant. Amen. Father, thank you for your goodness, for your grace, for your mercy. Thank you, Father, that you're a God that's for us and not against us. And uh, Lord, thank you that we just open up our hearts and we ask that in this week that your Holy Spirit will keep on taking the word that came to us and, and um, Lord, just, just let it bring forth a harvest in our lives, a harvest of righteousness. I pray that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.